Okay, let's go ahead and get started, David, and Margaret's gonna be here in a minute. So, Steve Moran here, I publish Senior Housing Forum. I assume that you probably mostly know that since I've been doing the inviting for the uh, webinar. And I've got with me David Smith, you can see him on the camera there, those of you who are viewing, and Margaret Weil had a, is just changing computers, so she'll be back with us in just a couple of minutes. We're going to start with a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that we are going to be, we actually are recording the uh, session and it will be available to you. We'll email it out uh, over the weekend or on Monday and we will also send it out to people who signed up but weren't able to attend. Um, my plan is to go for about 30 minutes um, plus maybe the, some time to do uh, some question and answers if you do have questions for any of the three or four of us. Um, and there are sort of two ways to do questions. You see a, a box where it says Q&A or um, you can do chat. I prefer that you just um, put your questions in the chat area. We'll be watching those as we talk and it just saves us having to, from having to go one other place to, to do that. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to actually pop up a slide. We're mostly going to be talking and so I just have a couple of slides here. And um, there's Margaret, they're um, just about done. Um, you have a nice view there, looking at a whole room. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and pop my uh, PowerPoint slide up for just a second. Um, so when I look at what a thought leader is, it's really the idea that you're an expert on whatever it is that you're, um, uh, uh, talking about, so senior living, and typically in senior living, it would even be a, a, um, a sort of a subspecialty on that. Um, oftentimes, you're obsessive about it. Um, if, if people pay attention to what you say, um, you influence other people's thinking, you get quoted, shared, and um, it's not the same as somebody who, as, um, who is an expert. And so those are really, I think, the key things to, to look at. Um, and um, so what I want to start by doing, I actually didn't do that, did I? That's what I do. Oh, shit. Did I turn it on? Oh. There. So there's the slide on that. Um, the second thing I want to start to talk about is a little bit about, so David, I guess maybe the first thing I would ask to you is Margaret's finishing up. Do you have any thoughts on what it means to be a thought leader besides what's up there? Um, first of all, thanks for hosting this. What a great idea. I love the new um, forum um, that you have for thought leaders. To, to me, a thought leader really, at least from my perspective, is a student. I, I came about uh, the industry trying to figure something out. I, I um, want to try to figure out how can you help through the conversion process? What, how can you become a change agent? And just became fascinated with it. And so I've practiced, I've studied, I've built communities and um, just continually research and listen to others in the field and try to, try to learn at every step of the way. Um, I'm passionate about it and it's something Thing that I'm that I'm dedicated to and and hopefully no, nowhere close to being finished with. Yeah, and one of the other things I would add that I know about you is that you're intensely curious. Uh, you and I were sharing books that we're reading, and and I suspect we'll both be out on Amazon in the next uh, hour or so after we're done here getting new books because I think that's one of the things you, that, that's really true about thought leaders is you can just never um, never learn enough. So Margaret, we're sort of starting out here talking about what a thought leader is, and I've got some bullet points here. Do you have any thoughts other than what's up there? Um, I think maybe it's sometimes you don't even know you're a thought leader, which I don't think I've ever considered myself a thought leader. Um, I think David's word passionate is um, what, people say about me more than, I don't know, you're the first person I think to ever call me a thought leader. Um, I think you know, there came a point in time when I felt like with the information that we get in all of the research we have the privilege of doing that I needed to try and 
help people hear this information and understand the information. And it, it you know, it is, you know, passionate, but I also feel like I'm almost possessed sometimes <laughs> because I think that as an industry, we're not changing fast enough and that we're not really doing all of the things that we should be doing. So if that's how you become a thought leader is to become crazed, then I can help people become crazed or possessed. <laughs> so, I'd like to add, if I could, just jump in. One thing about Margaret that I noticed um, is that Margaret is willing to just follow the facts to a result. So she's not necessarily, she may be working from a thesis or a hypothesis that she's trying to show, um, but she's following actually what she finds and, and what she learns. And so she's continuously reinventing. Yeah, and I think one of the things I would also say about Margaret, and it's funny that you don't, that you haven't heard people call you that before, because I, I would be honest and tell you that I think that of all the people in the industry, probably more than anybody else, you sit in that seat of being a thought leader that's most widely known. Um, as I've been talking to people about this webinar this week, I've had several people who have said, oh man, I got to be on there. And I, David, sorry, but I think it's probably more because Margaret's here than anybody else. And, um, you know, people just really re inspire. And part of what you do is you're willing to say the things that, as David said, you follow the data, um, even if it's not very popular. I think one of the things I really admire about you is you stand up and in, in front of audiences and and you say some pretty hard truths about how people are operating their buildings today. And you do it in such a way that people absorb it and I think make changes rather than just getting mad about it. Been somebody who's spoken and just made people mad before, I'm really, I really admire that, so. Um. Well, thank you. But, I, you know, we, we need to make changes. That's, and, and David's right, you know, it's, Things that I did, uh, you know, even just a few years ago in, let's say, satisfaction surveys and thought they were good then, you know, now I know that I need to be doing things differently and that the research, you know, yes, we were producing, you know, solid surveys, but then as we learn more, I learned that those aren't the, weren't the right questions to be asking. And so it's... You know, it, it, you're a thought leader, but it doesn't mean that maybe the, even the thoughts that I'm saying today are going to be right five years from now or two years from now. As we continue to dig deeper into things, I think we're going to learn more and more of, of that the, the way we're doing things today aren't really going to be the way we're doing things tomorrow. And it's not just because of technology or building design, but just, you know, just the way we think there's we're going to learn new things and it's it's not easy to say that you are doing things wrong or not at you know producing really what the most important results or best results but i think we have to admit that and then move forward and because you can change steve if i could just throw one thing in i think it was on the previous slide but it's reinforced on this one and that's the willingness to share what it is that we learn with perceived competitors and other people who are in the industry so that we create a body of knowledge from which we all can grow. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting you say that. I, um, on my new leadership website, uh, a couple of days ago, I, I posted um, uh, an article that was published in McKnight's and added some comments to it. It was a really good article. I can't even remember what it was right now, but it was something that was just, it really was helpful to the industry. And, and one of my team came back to me and said, do you really want to post an article from the competitor? And my answer was, I want to make the industry better. And this is really, really good stuff. And so it's really important to elevate that. And if we're, we're doing that, um, it, it makes everybody better off. Um, go ahead, David. I was just going to say with the total market penetration or absorption rate being 10% or less of age and income qualified people who could benefit from what we have to offer, the real win-win for everybody is to figure out how can we grow another four or five percent and and grow the industry without waiting for baby boomers or anything else to happen. 
Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So David, maybe you, Margaret sort of touched on, and I'm going to come back to her in a minute, but I'd like to have you sort of just talk more specifically about your journey of going to, from one guy who ended up owning a building to somebody who, uh, uh, when he speaks, people listen. Um, well, so I started off, I, I have a disability, as many of you know, I practiced law for 10 years. And I was looking for something that uh, in the practice of law that I never found, which is which was a, a notion of being able to help a large group of people um, in a significant way, in a transformational way. And so I built a community at age 35, and um, it was a large CCRC that's still our flagship in St. Louis. My partner was a residential builder, and my deal was, Charlie, you build the building, and I've sold a lot of residential real estate, so I'll help figure out how to fill it. Um, and quickly learned that the transactional selling style or selling something that people actually want and um, understand and um, wh where they want to live was very different than senior housing, which most people, no matter how nice the community is, simply don't want. And so trying to figure out that emotional entanglement, what do you have to do to help someone get ready um, to be able to accept senior housing? and understand the benefits um, is really what I first learned how to do myself then studied a lot to be able to articulate and be able to teach others and then eventually we uh, we've created a software program that support and encourages behaviors and measures things that actually tie to how can we help people say yes so what do you know today that you didn't know say three or five years ago um, that there are different ways that we can measure and encourage behaviors that foster the result that we're looking for, which is to have people who are a little bit um, higher functioning be able to say yes before, before the world crashes around them. Terrific. So, Margaret, let's talk a little bit about your journey into being a thought leader. I, I know this is probably a little hard for you since you don't see, really see yourself, but you started doing this research, and at some point in time, how did you come to realize you really had something to say to the whole industry? I think probably because of going to other conferences and hearing people speaking who I disagreed with or whose statements that were being made you know, all I had was contradictory evidence to that. And, you know, it's one of the things we've had to learn is how we can better communicate our research results. So in, in looking at that, can you sorry, my screen just blanked. I was in, I don't know why my screen blanked off. So but yeah, but you're back, you're back. Okay, well, the, the so, um, yeah, go ahead. You know, when you realize that, you know, the information that you've gotten, which is from a large representative sample, you know, a margin of error of generally less than 2%, sometimes even less than 1%, we've, you know, been able to get enough surveys in, and then you hear people saying things that you know aren't true. It, it, that's where you sort of become crazed. But, you know, we, we, we do hardcore research. You know, while, while we will do qualitative and do a bit of qualitative in focus groups, we, we don't do focus groups to, to make any statements about, you know, the market in general. It's, they're very specific in trying to get feelings from a small group of people. So we're, you know, we're always trying to use methods that are statistically valid, you know, they're robust statistical techniques. And so, you know, coming from, you know, uh, academic background and a PhD, it's, it's taken a long time to be able to, you know, put the science over on one side and try to connect it to the human beings who need to understand it and then use it and to have that impact. And it's, um, you know, and I, we still struggle with that. You know, I find I'm writing and rewriting reports today just to try and make it more understand. You know, everything looks clear to me, but to try and have the impacts. 
So I think it's what can we do that will, you know, help people, you know, to communicate with better with people. And I think that's, I've worked on trying to improve my communication. So maybe that's why, you know, I might be considered someone who says something that you might want to listen to. It's, we have good data, but, you know, I've tried to improve how we transmit that information. So as you, uh, and, and I'm going uh, to come to you, David, first, but once you started figuring out you had something, it, it's sort of a scary thing, right? You're sitting there and everybody's doing things one way and you're looking at it. And this is really what Margaret described and saying, no, that's not the right way to do that. We need to be doing it this way. Um, so first off, how do you get the courage to sort of buck the trend? Uh, for me, it started off as a matter of survival. I built a large community and I had to figure out how to fill it up and I didn't have the luxury of accepting my own beliefs when they weren't working. And so the proven theory that I had learned and the approach from the industry simply didn't work. So for me, it was, uh, you know, a matter of survival really to figure out a different approach. And I eventually found evidentiary theory based on the psychology of change eventually found data to support it, um, learned about customer-centric being, the consistency of being customer-centric from your um, sales process to your operations process and how important that was across. Um, eventually was able to prove that out and document it and then repeat it. And then perhaps the hardest part is similar to what Margaret is saying, how to simplify that, how to find ways of communicating it so it's practical and actionable um, by the people that you're trying to share it with. So because I, I'm really focused, I, I know there are going to be both senior living providers and, 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 and folks who are providing or selling products and services to senior living here. So we've got a, a broad group. But I guess what I, I would really like to spend a little bit of time exploring is once I've sort of realized that I have something to say, how, how do I, how did you start getting people to actually pay attention to, to what you were saying? And I'm going to kick this to Margaret to start with. Well, I think I've been lucky, you know, because we've been able to do some work that's been published by American Seniors Housing Association and some by Nick and, you know, even some by Alpha Argentum. So, you know, when you get published in different places, that helps. Um, when you get invited to speak, that helps. You know, but I think, again, I, I think for me too, it, it's not, you know, I didn't set out to do that. My, I set out to try and tell people what I had learned and to try to because and to say that I think we can do better and it's really not going to cost a lot more to do these things better but we can do better at a variety of things but I think you know the other element that maybe when I think we have to be willing to be honest and to admit you know and number one to be honest and if we to not make up stuff you know, if we, you know, if I don't have, you know, like I was, I spoke in uh, Chicago or, you know, in Naperville, uh, whatever day, today's Friday, Wednesday, and, um, you know, people asked me questions about what I was speaking about, and they'd ask me, well, you know, do you think it means this? And I'd say, you know, I think that's a great perspective, or I think, you know, you may be onto something there, there, but I don't know. I don't know if that's what causes this because I, I, you know, that's a new perspective. I haven't looked at that. And one thing that sort of drives me crazy is, uh, you know, I see some people, you know, uh, you know, say things, and you know, I think it just was something that came through their head just at that moment. But they say it as if it is documented with research, as if it is the truth. And that it that, and they say it that this is going to be relevant then to every other person over the age of seventy five or every other person over the age of eighty, and you know I know you know we we have great generalizations in this industry. I think that's one of the reasons why we don't serve 
more than 10%. I think that's why we don't increase market share is because we think we've, we think we have the model. We think we have the product and that we should just keep replicating the stuff that we have when, you know, we're, we're not serving more people because we have very little differentiation across product and we're all, you know, we have created a commodity out of a product that isn't perfect. And we, you know, so instead of trying to replicate, you know, looking in the rear view mirror and doing what's been done, we need to be looking forward and trying to better understand the customer and creating product that is better than what we have today. And, you know, some research that we've done shows that, you know, there are some models that really are doing better than others, that, you know, that they're, they're, they have a much higher proportion of people who feel at home. They have a much higher proportion of people who are very satisfied. And we can trace it back to, to what they're doing. It's not the building and it's not, you know, the amenities. It's not. And we keep thinking, you know, that that's it. And so, but, you know, I, I'm going to go back to my first point is, you know, that does not make me a popular person, but the changes that we need, I think the, the physical plants are very good. I think, you know, we do have very professional people, but we still need to be molding how we interact with human beings. And again, the cost is not expensive to do what we need to do. So, and, and you know, I'm sort of generalizing here because it's, but it's not the same for, there are many subsectors of our market. And, you know, as long as we continue to call everybody a senior and we call it seniors housing and we don't try differentiating any product, we're going to stay at 10%. So I have a question that uh, one of the uh, audience has asked, but it's directed at you, Margaret, I think. And, and the question is this, what exactly constitutes statistically valid in senior living, giving sort of the, the niche segment we're in? The niche segment we're in. Well, we are in a niche segment, and the niche segment is those people who, you know, I guess, do seniors housing. So, but statistically valid, you know, we, we I mean, we, in a statistical terminology is that when you have a population, let's say of over 10,000 consumers, and we do, that, you know, I can be statistically valid if I survey a thousand of them. That would be representative. It's like in satisfaction surveys, though, when you have 30 residents in a community and you only get back 25 surveys out of the 30, you still don't have enough surveys to, to really provide an accurate representation of the residents there. The smaller the population, you really almost have to have a survey from everyone. So with 30, 30 residents, you need about 28 to have a representative sample. That's the statistically valid, is knowing when what you're saying is truly statistically valid or when it's a maybe a good indicator but odds are that i could repeat that research and it will be different if i don't have a statistically valid set of data Perfect. and it's defined you know i don't think we want to get too statistical no, no, I, and, and i really want to come back to this question of once you've got something that you're passionate about you're crazed about how do you get people to pay attention? I've got a slide that's up on the screen that you can see, and I sort of talked a little bit about my journey. I think one of the things that's probably a little different about mine versus uh, David and Margaret's is that, uh, and, and you may be able to help me, I may be wrong on this, is that mine's probably more compressed. Um, yeah, sort of my backstory is, is when I was in my 20s, I did some work in the senior living space in early 30s. Walked away from it for about 15 years and came back into it just a little over five years ago. And so I'm growing from nobody had ever heard of me to having a, a significant pre presence. And so I worked, and it was not really 
for me, it was not really about saying, I want to go out and be a thought leader. It was really about saying, I've got this blog that I think I can turn into a business. And the only way I can turn it into it is if there are enough people who are paying attention and discovering that people were interested in what I had to say. But David, how did, how did you go once you, you know, you, you, so you went through this, this time where you had to change what you were doing in order to survive. How did you then go about evangelizing that to the rest of the senior living world? Really, it's about results. It's about going out and, for me, a lot of work in the field. So other than the last um, couple of years, for nearly 30 years, I've spent three to six months in the selling trenches myself, hands-on, um, as well as doing sales management and consulting, but just constantly taking behaviors and how I how we teach behaviors and what to look for into the field and figuring out what works. Because in the end, um, you know, that's what really drives the, the, the process in terms of what, what works, what doesn't work, and then figuring out ways to make it easy for people, once you sort of figure out what works, to be able to adapt and adopt that into their own day-to-day -day, um, workflows. So, but beyond that, I want to say, go a little bit further than that. I want to ask this question of how do you actually, once you've got these ideas, how do you get people to pay attention? I mean, I look at, you know, there are blogs and so much stuff out there. And somehow the two of you have managed to make yourself heard above and beyond the, the rest of the noise. Thoughts on, and really the question I'm asking is, not only how you did it, but if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I've got this great idea and, and you sort of listen to what they have you say and you say, you know, that's really, that's, that's a pretty good thing. You ought to be sharing that. How would they go about doing that? So obviously the kind of the things that you do to write and publish, Margaret's done that on a grand scale in terms of impacting uh, industry, um, speaking at conferences, participating, um, sharing with other people within the industry whenever you can. Um, and again, I think just constantly um, learning from the people that you're around. So when I go to a conference, I think, what can I learn? Who am I going to be able to see that can, that's really thinking about something new or different or innovative or has, wants to challenge the, the theories and approaches that, that uh, we're looking at? I think you have to be open to that. I really think that's the, the key, and people will listen if you generate, if you do things that help them. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's really important. I'm going to tell a story, David, that I told on you last week when we were at dinner at the Smash Conference. Um, fairly early on in our, our relationship, um, you sent me an email, and you said, hey, can we talk? And, of course, I, you know, being able to talk to the famous David Smith was really a cool thing, and so I called you up, and... Um, it was a Friday afternoon. That's how much of an impact I remember it was. And you said, you know, you publish some really good stuff occasionally, but there's some other stuff that's not very good. And I'll tell you, it was really crushing to me. But rather than getting defensive, I knew that the critics are the people who help me get smarter and better. And we talked and I probably still publish some stuff you don't like, but I think it's getting better. You comment fairly often. So um, but and so I think that what you say is just getting out and talking to people um, on the slide that I've got up here I sort of talked about what my personal journey was and I recognize that it's very different um, for, for other people But as I thought about stuff I wrote things down and that helped me to coalesce and then I published and I asked people to read it and I asked people what they thought about it and sometimes that's that's a pretty painful experience um, and then you, have to make yourself, you have to make yourself vulnerable for that, Steve. You have to, yeah. well, you're, what, you're, insanely, around, right? you're insanely curious. You, you come about this almost as um, somebody who's exploring every time for the first time to think about this. Yep. And you, you have the presence of just actually wanting to know what the answer is as opposed to trying to make a point. Yeah, I just want to hear your stories. I mean... I, I'm, and, and I'm really passionate about hearing people's stories right now. So one of the things I sort of say as much to the audience is I'm particularly looking for stories that hit people's hearts um, in the senior living community. So I want to hear those stories where a resident's life has been changed, uh, uh, a team member's life has been changed, a family member's been changed. And it's remarkable to me 
that we don't do a great job of that. And I think, Margaret, you sort of talk, talk about the empirical side of that, but I think it really comes down to being able to actually change people's lives. So, um, so Margaret, how do you go about learning new stuff today? <laughs> well, I'm learning, you know, every day I learn new stuff, absolutely every day, you know. But I, I learned new stuff in Chicago from the people who were in the audience because we were able to have some really great discussions over the six or so hours I was with people. And, you know, when I put something out, I also try to get feedback. Does this resonate? You know, have you seen this? Is this what is true for you? What's different? What would work for you? So, uh, you know, I agree that having the opportunity to, to get feedback in the field is incredibly important. And that's um, every time I work within a community, um, you know, I, I've always... I can't remember names, but I can re remember numbers. I think maybe that's one reason I'm in the field that I'm in. So I can walk through a building and see something and then, you know, just a, a resident maybe interacting with an employee or something occurring and I'll remember that we did a study and this is actually a live enactment of one of the conclusions that we made from the study. And, you know, I'll remember the numbers that were associated with that. And then I'll, sometimes I'll go through and I'll say, ah, I wouldn't have predict, I predicted that from what I, I did in another study. So mm -hmm. you're always getting reality checks. And I look for reality checks, um, not, you know, again, research is research. It's not until we make sure that it is applicable and valid, reliable, usable, and useful. It's not something you know, that sh should be alive, I guess. So it's that, you know, another thing just about the journey, I think, you know, I'm a person who doesn't say no, and I am a person, I think, volunteering to participate in various initiatives among the major associations is important for us as members. And I think in every organization that I've been in, you know, I've always felt that I'm going to get back from it what I put into it. And I think that, you know, your networking, getting to know people is important so that you, you know, and the best way to network is to be able to work beside someone on a project that may not benefit you specifically, but it's going to benefit the industry. And, you know, I it's, it isn't, I think that's one way that I've gotten to know people over the years is I volunteer and offer to do things and participate. Um, and that's, I think, an important part of the journey because, you know, once you do make a connection, you know, then you've got somebody who can help with your reality check or they feel comfortable enough to say, you know, Margaret, you're crazy. <laughs> so... That's I'd like to piggyback on that for just, if I could piggyback on that for just a moment, and um, uh, Margaret was the first one to invite me to participate. It was probably 25 years ago when she was the president of NASLI and asked me to serve on a committee. It was the first time somebody nationally had asked me to do a presentation and to participate. And so I, uh, I'm forever grateful for that. I was thank I was going to say the other way to be known is to survive. <laughs> By being in the industry, you know, for as long as some of us have been in the industry, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I find every day, you know, is new and exciting and different. And, you know, you guys are probably going to want to shoot me to get rid of me out of the industry, but I think I'm here still for a while. So, you know, well, being, I, you know surviving I, long enough is a good way to get known. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think the time on, on, on the earth and in the industry is really, really important. I, I remember the first time I went to a Nick meeting and I, the blog was still new and I, there were a few people who were reading, but I didn't really know how many. And I actually set a goal of meeting a hundred people. 
And I would, um, I'd walk into a crowd of people and I'd, I'd say, hi, my name is Steve Moran. And um, I set a goal to meet 100 people. And so that's why I'm butting into your conversation. And most of the time, people were really good about it and even humored about it. And even today, even though going to these conferences is very different because I know so many people, one of the things I do to, to help myself, because you wouldn't know it if you met me probably, but I, my nature is actually very shy, is that one of the things I've been doing this year is I've been carrying this little um, uh, counter device. Um, and every time I have a conversation with somebody at a, um, at a conference, I, I click it. And I started out keeping it sort of hidden in my pocket. Now I just carry it out and people ask me what I'm doing with it. So this is from this is from Smash. I haven't reset it yet, and it was at 91 until I just clicked it. So I have conversations with 91 different people at Smash Shine, and it just keeps me motivated to look at those numbers. They don't really mean anything. Um, and then the one other thing I would like to add to this whole process of becoming two other things actually I'd like to add. The first is that what I'm hearing from both of you, and I would say this is also true with me, is that none of us sat down and said, I want to go be a thought leader. But what happened is we started working in the industry. We discovered that we had something that we thought was important to say and that people, it was resonating with people. And, but as I will go through the conference, the other thing I would say is I spent a lot of time saying, what do you do in asking people questions? And it's so easy, particularly if you're on, if you're selling products and services is to want to try to push your, what you're doing rather than just to learn from people. So, and, if I ask you, David, I say, what do you do uh, after you're done telling me you're going to turn around and do what? You ask me what I do, and that gives me a chance to talk. Yeah, which is really all what empathy and emotional intelligence is all about. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Well, we've sort of run out our clock here. I'm going to ask if there are any more uh, questions, and if there are, you can type them in. I'm going to give it about a uh, 20 seconds here, and then uh, we'll call it good. I will send out both slides and a recording of the conference to everybody who uh, was either on or signed up. Uh, David, Margaret, uh, 